All right, hello world. This is Video Game Crosstalk, episode 021 at the monthly podcast of gamers talking about tech, science, and whatever else comes to mind. I'm your host, Anthony Rossi, and with me this episode is cosplayer Ellie Winston. Ellie, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you for inviting me. Ah, it's been it's been a complicated road to get here. We've been in talks for a little while. <laughs> and as I've mentioned in our emailing, uh, I only have time in my personal life to really do one episode a month, which I know is like really slow for release or uh, content production, but... It's important to take your own time. It really is. And uh, something that uh, let's just have this podcast will know, my son Jacob, he is about 15 months at this point. Aww. Yeah. Oh, he is absurdly ridiculously photogenic and as of this past weekend he just started taking his first unassisted steps oh that's so cute <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh so obviously that video i've posted on my personal facebook and your know, big proud daddy moment it is <laughs> jacob is our uh first born he is the only one that we can handle at this point but um, again i i feel the need to reiterate this especially after my last podcast with jessica leary in regards to people letting games kind of take over their life i i, I can't let that happen i refuse to let that happen so gotta take care of these moments and record them and upload them for the extended family to <laughs> view and all that other fun stuff completely so like I said, it's been a while. We've been talking for a while, but we're finally here. Yes, we awesome. are. So before we get into much else, um, what have you been playing recently? Um, my big one. I actually uh, I bought Overwatch over the holiday weekend, and I've been trying oh, to nice. play it ever since I played the beta. Because I played the beta, and I played it for, I think it was like three days straight. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, um, at the time, I didn't have a job or anything, so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to keep playing this until it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so I played it. I really liked it. Um, at one point, I was wanting to cosplay Mercy really badly, and then I kind of dropped off. I didn't have the money for it, and then I saw that uh, they were doing 50% off, and I was like, oh, finally, oh. I can pick up this game that I've been waiting for for two years. <laughs> hey. Yeah, I gave the beta a try. It's just that my personal style of games, I don't really get into the, if it's like just multiplayer only. Yeah. It's, it's just personally, it's of no interest to me. I... And I feel really bad saying that because it's an amazing game. No. And when I did play the beta, even the beta like was so smooth. It was, I, I really appreciated it. Um, I didn't find very many bugs when I originally played it, but um. Oh Go my ahead. goodness, uh, with the whole uh, PvP versus PvE aspect, um, mm -hmm. I'm the same way. I really hate PvP-only games. Like, when I played Titanfall, I played only the campaign. <laughs> uh, that took you, what, three hours <laughs> or something like that? Uh, I, it I'm was being a, a nice little cynical, campaign, but... Though. It, was, it was a beautiful campaign, but um, yes, mm -hmm. it's short. It should have been longer. With Overwatch, I don't know, maybe it's just because it's only PvP, the reason that I like it. Like, um, when I was younger, I used to play Team Fortress 2 a lot. I played okay. it almost religiously. <laughs> and um, I don't know. It's I prefer PvE because there's that aspect of being able to actually do something without having to worry about other people's feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. Like, um, Assassin's Creed Origins is a really good uh, example. I dumped hours and hours into that game but then uh i picked up overwatch and I haven't been able to put it down fantastic just, i mean again yeah. it is so smooth it and is smooth. they they've got it down uh, for how to promote and how to maintain and support oh, yeah. this game definitely they know they definitely know what they're doing and speaking of assassin's creed origins i finally picked that up over the holiday Oh, I was so nervous. I was so nervous to pick it up because um, I'm a longtime Assassin's Creed fan, and I I just hated the last few games. And it was like, you know what? Mm -hmm. No more. I'm done. And then as Origins came out, I said, no, I'm not buying this. And then I rented it for a night at Redbox, and I was like, you know, I, I gotta buy it. <laughs> Man, we're in. <laughs> yeah, I'm the basically. I'm absolutely the same way. I loved the or 
not AC Origins, the or Origins of the series. Yes, yes. Was just fantastic. Like everything about it, the conspiracy, craziness, oh, yeah. the mix between the sci-fi and the fantasy, the whole thing of learning about the ancient past, a little oh, bit of yeah. old history, uh, the first real stealth game that I actually enjoyed. And then as the series progressed, it became more action heavy mm -hmm. to the point oh, yeah. where it was Black Flag, which was a really good game. Fantastic Assassin's Creed. But it got to the point where we're not even really pretending to be stealthy at this point. I'm launching myself <laughs> onto a pirate ship with four single shot pistols. Yeah, Edward Kenway was not very subtle. No, and then we move on to Syndicate, where Jacob says, hey, instead of working from the shadows, how about we become the leader of a London street gang? And I'm like, how is yeah. this? <laughs> this is not working from the shadows. I was not a fan of that one. <laughs> when it came to Assassin's Creed, uh, I feel like the last good game was Assassin's Creed 3, and that was when they killed off our main character. <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> and uh, I just, I was so disappointed to see that they didn't bring back any of the modern day stuff. And I understand that a large part of the Assassin's Creed community was saying, hey, we don't want the modern stuff because it's boring. But the people that were there for the hardcore players, the people that really, really loved the series, that was what they were holding on to. They wanted more of it. That's why they kept right. buying the games. We wanted to know what happened with Juno. We wanted to know what happened with Desmond and all that stuff. And it was just so sad to see it go. And I just, I don't understand how you can even, how it can be an Assassin's Creed game without the modern day aspect. I know. And that's what it just drove me off, I guess. I, um, so I didn't play Unity. I played Rogue. Rogue was absolutely glorious. Nobody else played it because it was for 360. <laughs> Which, sidetrack, I was debating whether or not I wanted to bring this up during the Gaming Geekery section, but Rogue is getting remastered. Yes, it is, and I am super excited. I 100%ed that game. I was, I was all about it. I do enjoy Shay. <laughs> And, and I'm like doing my little happy dance, like a little squeal over here right now because Rogue is the only one I have not played because at the time I was uh, on Xbox and I was a day one Xbox One consumer. Yeah. So that was when Black Flag and Rogue were like simultaneously released. Unity. And... Yeah. Yeah. Assassin's so Creed Unity. That was on the previous one. So I would always say, like, I've played every Assassin's Creed game except for Rogue because of that reason. It's getting a remaster. I'm all happy and I will absolutely be purchasing that. And I may do the sad, sad, lame thing of putting it on easy just so I can burn through the story. But um, that has more. Hmm? It's entirely up to you. I would say that the story is relatively short, so you might not want to. Okay. But, I'll kick um, around the idea. But the only reason why yeah. I'm like considering putting games on easy settings is because it goes back to being a new father. Uh, I still consider myself a new father. Um, even though my son's one year old at this point. It's, I yeah, just don't just have the time. life on the hard mode. <laughs> yeah, you know, everything else is uh, cranked up there. And speak, do I have a puppy? Yeah, every once in a while, my dogs will come into the office. Are you out there? Thought I heard a chain rattling around. And uh, they just kind of visit me as I'm doing the podcasting, but we'll see what happens. Aww. Yeah, doggos. So, like dogs. anyway, like I've been saying, I uh, picked up Assassin's Creed Origins, and I actually was just playing that uh, before coming into the office and getting this podcast started. I... I'm still level 10 or 11 right now, so still pretty early, mm -hmm. still pretty early on, but they they were right in taking a year off from the oh, series. Oh, yes, for sure. I mean, like, even they just though need to... the movie didn't turn out that great, I was a little <sighs> disappointed. <laughs> the sadness. But the I sadness. mean, they really needed to take a break, and I'm really glad that they did. Yes. Oh, the, the sadness every time the movie comes up. Uh, like, was... what, what would have been beautiful is in that case, they would have just stayed in the 
the history portion of it do the entire story in the history and then at the last scene have someone like snap awake out of the animus and say did you record all that and then just cut (laughs) to black that would have been really good um that's it's kind of funny because that's exactly the opposite of what we were saying earlier where people want more of the modern story (laughs) oh yeah i know but to get (laughs) Yeah, as soon as I get done saying, no, we need the modern story, I come out and say, just like you said. But um, I think think the big reason for that, though, is because the movie was aimed towards the the general consumer in terms of people that haven't even seen the games or anything. So then going historical would have been a better move money-wise, I think, because it does Mm -hmm. sell. The whole history aspect of it does sell pretty well. Oh, absolutely. Um, and you can never make hardcore players happy with a movie. <laughs> no, no. The only way you can do that, and I think they're figuring that out. And I think I've mentioned this before that I haven't heard anything, but I'm fairly certain there's a Borderlands movie still in production. Oh, or at I least in that. development or something. I know. And, um, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I believe they said that they are not going to try to retell the story. They're going to tell a story that exists within the universe, hmm. which I call. think is way better because games in general, and I, I would love to have like a full panel or just a full dedicated episode just to discuss what would make a proper video game movie or something to that effect, because there's just too much story within a 60 hour, 100 hour game to crunch down into even two and a half or even like a Lord of the Rings three hour marathon yeah. movie. It's just yeah. too much to go through. So having a side story in the established world, I think would be their a better route to pursue. I almost think they should pull like a Rogue One in terms of okay. having the having the universe that you have already built and applying interesting characters with an interesting motive. I think that's all you really need. Okay. If that makes sense. You, you know, we'll we'll send this to Sony <laughs> and they'll get to working on the development and we'll see how this works out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, I hear there's a Metal Gear Solid movie coming out, or that they're trying to get it started. Really? I'm yeah, gonna... there's this one guy, I I don't know his name, but he's been, like, trying to get the rights to make this movie for years. And everybody in the community knows him, and they're, they know he's an avid gamer, so they're like, just let him make the movie, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, through the power of the internet, let me just check this out. Well, there is an entry for the IMDb. Well, you're so f- uh, fandom power. So there's news. Yeah, it's been yeah. talked about a lot, but I haven't seen anything official. Hmm. All right. I'll drop a link or two into the show notes once this gets uh, published. So <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. So moving on a little bit. Now, I introduced you as a cosplayer. So, Ellie, tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> Being I'll just a leave cosplayer? it super over end. Oh, so, all right, so let's start yeah. with like the obvious the obvious questions. What was like your first cosplay? Or like where did you get started? Uh Assassin's Creed was my first cosplay. <laughs> really? Yeah, um I fell in love with uh Assassin's Creed 1 and 2 and oh. I, I don't think I had played Brotherhood at that point. Okay. But um uh I fell in love with the the ho- the story, I guess. The whole aspect of the fandom and um I wanted to make my own assassin with me and my cousin. So we ended up making our own uh, Assassin's Creed costumes and we went to a local convention and it was really nerdy. <laughs> 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 and then um I don't know. So this, so this first one, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this. Was it uh, the standard, like, Altair hooded um, assassin? I had originally made an Altair, uh, yeah, hooded assassin uh, outfit. It was basically a replica of Altair's, but I never took any pictures because it was made out of bed sheets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm all respect to the one of the original Master Assassins, but... He was lacking in the flair, which Ezio obviously made up for. 
Definitely, yeah. Um, the only photo that I have of my original costume was the one that I made uh, kind of Renaissance style-ish. Okay. I don't know. There was, there was a corset involved. It was great. <laughs> I'm sure if it was Renaissance style, I'm sure there was plenty of fabric still involved in that design. But yeah, that's what kind of kicked off my whole uh, interest in cosplay. I okay. had... I'd always had like an interest in anime and video games and stuff, but uh, the cosplay aspect never really kicked in until I realized that I knew how to sew and that I could make the things that I want to make. <laughs> hey, yeah, you know, with a lot of things, it seems to like, if you've got an interest, just like give it a go. Mm -hmm. Just see what happens. Don't That's sit around like, oh, maybe I could do this, maybe I could do that. Screw, just go, just go for it. And if you fail. Meh. So, so what? You know, dust yourself off, see if you can do this again. A lot of people, um, well, the people that I hear that come up to me and say, hey, I really want to cosplay. How do I get started? Um, one thing that I see consistently is uh, a lot of people are just too afraid to start, which okay. is a little counterproductive. <laughs> That's... Um, <laughs> There are, uh, a lot of people are just really afraid of messing up, and it's really not as hard as everybody thinks that it is. It, it There's a lot of research and a lot of practice involved, but um, all of the things that make a good cosplay are easy to find, and everybody does the same... Oh, not exactly the same thing. So, like, um, if you meet a foam smith, or somebody that makes armor with foam, um, okay. there's, like, these set of directions that you have that you can alter yourself if you want to do it a specific way but it's almost as if it's almost as if there's like a step-by-step -step, this is how you do it in terms it's not like rocket science <laughs> i don't know how to explain <laughs> it it's not rocket science it's gluing foam together in a way that makes objects <laughs> yeah and there there are plenty of online tutorials for like anything that you're going to do yeah, um, and I think people just get held up on the fact that they don't know. They're not a master off the bat. I think that's where mm -hmm. a lot of people have issues. So, yeah, allow yourself to have a learning curve. You don't have to come out the gate looking like pro or semi-pro. Like, it, it, yes. it's okay to do a casual cosplay. It's okay to show off your fandom, even if you're not, like, 100%. This is absolutely amazing. Just g give it a go. Uh, I actually did a, I actually did a handsome Jack cosplay for my office Halloween party, oh. and I'm really mad that I didn't take any pictures of it. Did but it turn out fantastic? I thought it did. <laughs> did anyone know who you were? That's a better actually, question. Yes, yes, and uh, that one person who knew who I was absolutely lost his mind. <laughs> <laughs> Because he saw, like, the Hyperion H on my back, and he mm -hmm. looked, I had this, like, other brown wig going on, and I had, yeah, the, like, the gray jacket with the jeans with the yellow stripe going down, and he looks, he's like, wait a second, is that a Hyperion H? Are you handsome, Jack? I'm like, yeah, brother, and he's like, oh my god! It's like you um, peel back your shoulder and look at your face and be like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I recycled that for a friend's Halloween party uh, a weekend or two later. And also, here's another tip if you're getting into cosplay. A little bit of creativity can go a long way. So I had no idea what I was going to do for Handsome Jazz jack's mask like was i gonna purchase one and kind of paint it up was i just going to draw out the outlines around my face to make it look like i'm wearing something i wasn't really sure what to do and then like inspiration struck I'm like wait a second he wears the mask because he has the vault symbol like imprinted on his face from when lilith kind of punched the symbol into mm -hmm. him how would i just grab some blue face paint and draw the arc symbol on my face and be like oh i'm handsome jack without his mask it's easier and a little bit more nuanced good point yeah <laughs> thinking outside the box helps yes i'm like hey i'm not lazy i'm just nuanced <laughs> yeah okay, um, cool. so you start off with assassin's creed 
Yes, uh, I did. What else have you been doing as far as the cosplay works? Uh, I did Assassin's Creed for how many years? Probably three or four. I, I kept updating it and kept going because I was just such a big fan. I just kept making a new one every time they had a new game. <laughs> All right. So I did that. Um, after Assassin's Creed, I did. Uh, I built my first suit of armor, which was the rookie from Halo ODST. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. It was. Um, How? Hold on, I need to huh? look that up real quick. Okay, so I'm looking at the rookie right now because I've I only played a little bit of ODST. Mm -hmm. Um. Wow. So you built a f this full set? Uh, yes, I did. It was my wow. first. Um, I had a lot of help. Okay. Um, when I originally started uh, the Assassin's Creed cosplay, I didn't have very many uh, cosplay friends. Okay. And so when I went to these conventions locally, I started making more costume friends. And one of which was um, a close friend of mine now who's named Crystal. And she does Halo cosplay. And she kind of introduced me to the idea of being able to actually do armor and what I wanted to do cosplay-wise. Okay. And so it took like eight months, but I ended up with a costume that I have still worn today and I'm very happy with. Okay, so there's a lot going on in sci-fi space marine armor suits. So yes. like how did you how did you even go about starting or picking a starting point? Um, thankfully I had like I said, I had Crystal to help me uh with a direction at least and um the first thing that we did was uh we were members of a community that had patterns which was very helpful <laughs> okay so, yes so, very um, very much so i can imagine <laughs> so you print out these patterns um and they're called pepakura files and some of people have made them in a way that you can print them out and use them with foam so uh it involves scaling it to your body size, then printing it out, and then tracing it on a foam, and then gluing the foam together, and making geomic pieces, and it's a big mess. But uh, that's where I started, was with the foam parts, because that was what I was new at, and what I needed to practice the most. Okay, and what, what were those files called? Uh, Pepakura, uh, P-E-P, uh, hold on, I would have to type it out. Go for it. P e p a k u r a Pepakura. It's um a three D modeling program that or not three D modeling. It's a program that transfers three D models and exports them as uh two D models. Okay. So if you put a cube into this program, it will print it out on a piece of paper flat so that you can glue it back together and turn it into a cube in real life. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wow, okay, so I'm definitely including a link or something in the show notes for that. So Pepe Curl. All right, nice. So you use these files to create the the outlines that would then become the foam parts for the armor? Uh, kind of. It's... That, I probably just butchered that entire <laughs> sentence. <laughs> um, more or less, Pepe Curl. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, so somebody will make a 3D model. Um, yeah. This can be somebody has made it, or it can be torn from a game. Um, you import it into Pepakura, and you can unfold it, is what the term is, where you can unfold it into a flat shape. Okay. Um, if, if you're, you can use Pepakura to make resin models, if you want, by not turning it into a foam file, which mm -hmm. involves uh, taking out a lot of extra detail. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So, so I looked it up real quick, and so Pepakura yeah. is actually the name of the software. That is correct. Yes. All right. And I see I'm they sorry. have some geometry models for free. All right. Awesome. I'm awesome. so sorry. <laughs> oh no! No worries at all. That's why we got the. That's why we have Google in front of us as we're doing this podcast. And yeah. uh, we have access to an entire planet's intelligence and history at our fingertips. Might as well use it for something other than cat videos. So yeah. Awesome. Um, if anybody wants to make halo specifically, there is a website called the 405th.com. I still use their website in terms of finding files if I need it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because they're I'm pretty sure they're just readily available. I have a lot of friends locally that just have all of them downloaded anyway. Okay. That is a good way to start off is by finding a file. Just Google um, Pepakura a uh, cat helmet or something and you can usually find a file if none exist you're gonna have to either make it by hand or you're gonna have to hire someone to 3d model it or find a way <laughs> um so the, yeah that's how people start is they make they get the files they're basically patterns you print them out on paper you transfer that onto foam and glue it all together to make a 3d object wow so there are all sorts of resources out there Yes, there's, uh, there's no correct way to do anything, honestly. <laughs> and I think actually that's kind of an important point for someone who's, I mean, just as like a fan going to a local con or something like that, if you want to get into cosplay or thinking about putting something together, there's no need to reinvent the wheel that is in correct. any form, shape, or method, because it seems like a lot of this stuff is either either someone has done that cosplay before or they've done something similar enough to it where like your basis of design has already either been done or has oh, yeah. been started for you. Professional cosplayers will always be learning. That is something that a lot of people forget about. I think sometimes in okay. terms of, um, you have to have an open mind. You have to look at other people's stuff and figure out what they're doing and what, why their stuff looks nice versus mm -hmm. trying to stick on your own pattern, uh, stick by your own rules, I guess. Um, you want to keep striving and keep learning in order to get better and to hold yourself back by not wanting to copy anyone is kind of self-destructive i guess mm -hmm. well and i guess you know, one last little bit i'll say about it is you know look at some other cosplay or people in the cosplay community follow their social media accounts and those that i do follow they are usually pretty good at showing off progress prints of things that they're working on oh yeah and that you know along with you know here's how they're progressing through it here's what methods they're using it also you know removes some of the mystique of the finished product when you can see the phases that it goes through so it's not yes. like they just come out being these perfect polished perfectly formed pieces you know, they get roughed out mistakes yeah. are made you i know, feel like that's what scares a lot of people do mm-hmm when they just see this master chief that looks so awesome and they haven't seen the seven months of work prior. <laughs> right. All, all the foam dust on the floor, all the scrapped other armor pieces that, you know, were cut too small. So now you can't even use them for like scrap for anything else. Oh yeah. yeah. You're going to make, when you start foam smithing and stuff like this, you're going to make everything way too big or way too small. And it's going to take you forever in order to learn how to make it your size. And it's aggravating, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you promise, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to hate it and you're going to want to quit and you're going to ask everybody, what am I doing wrong? And I promise you're not doing anything wrong. It's just you need to learn. You need practice okay yeah, but, just keep yeah this is basically how it goes down yeah oh, um uh, another thing with the foam smithing is um i had made a lord saladin costume um and that was i think emerald city 2016 um okay so please tell me there are him. pictures of this yes i can actually link you one Yay! right now <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at my Instagram while I'm talking to you, so it helps. Okay. There were no files that existed for Lord Saladin. That was just because he was a new character at the time. Mm -hmm. But um, since I was familiar enough with Destiny, I knew what armor pieces kind of looked like his stuff. And that's another thing that you mentioned earlier, where maybe somebody hasn't made the same exact thing as you, but somebody's made something similar. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to more or less take these pieces of armor that I knew about. If anybody knows about destinystlgenerator.com, that is where you can find 3D models of armor that's in the game. 
and I used that and brought it into Peppakura and turned it into the foam files that I needed in order to make my costume. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a lot of willpower. It's a lot of mm -hmm. wanting something hard enough and making it happen because you want it, I guess. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a whole lot of uh, determination yeah. going on. You got to make your own fate. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I'm looking at the Destiny STL generator right now. Oh, yeah. wow, there's like just all sorts of stuff you can just so drop Destiny in there. SC, yeah, DestinySTLGenerator.com runs off of Bungie.net's uh, armor previewer. So if you have a character that you can preview from the game as a 3D model, mm -hmm. it pulls those 3D models. So it has literally anything that is in the game right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it pulls those 3D models and presents them as um, individual models that you can download. It's very convenient. <laughs> I, I guess so. No, I'm getting like all sorts of like nerd right now, just getting all sorts of excited, uh, like unnaturally so. So if I put in, yeah, because I'm just going through this list and it's just everything. It just seems it to be everything. a list. It of everything that's in the game. It is literally any armor piece that you can obtain or gun. Okay, yeah, I'm looking like the screen that I'm on right now. I see the Death Singers Herald, the Dujo Show 2, Exodus Vest, Days of Iron Grips, Desolate Vest. Yeah, I'm in the Ds right now, apparently. Fun fact <laughs> for, for anybody that's actually going to use this website and you are going to build armor with it, always pick female files because the female model in Destiny is more accurate to the human body than the male files are if you really? buy yes if you get the male files they're gonna be way too thick and you're gonna cry <laughs> huh. well pro tip there yeah a little bit because i built um when i started off i built lord saladin's legs using a male file and it just they were like they were so wide i could put like my head in it <laughs> oh my god <laughs> He, he, he is quite a large man. <laughs> he never skips leg day. He's got some games. No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ellie, you also have a little online shop going on, correct? Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would you like to mention that at all? But yeah, I run an online shop called Silver Pocket Studios on Etsy. I do commissions if people contact me. I'm currently full until probably next year. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, um, I have a man currently asking about a Cade 6, and I have a bunch of Titan marks that I need to finish. And blankets. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, one of the dogs decided to join me up here in the office, and she is a loud snorer. So... Oh. <laughs> Hi, puppy. Yeah, her eyes are closed. She doesn't even know she's snoring. Fantastic. Oh, All right, so you've got uh, quite the full plate going on. Yeah, um, on top of that, I'm trying to save for a trip to Australia, so it's a little hectic. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. Any particular reason? What's going on in Australia? Oh, um, my boyfriend lives there, actually. Oh. He, he's also a cosplayer. His um, tag is Praetorian Fabrications. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, he cosplayed as Lord Saladin at Dragon Con, and that's how we started talking. <laughs> He All right. For help with his Lord Saladin and ended up commissioning me for his cape. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I kind of like you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're pretty awesome. Yeah. Nice. Oh, man, that's. All right. Well, you start clipping coupons <laughs> or something. <laughs> uh, I'm more afraid of the flight more than anything. It's like a 16 hour flight and I hate planes. <sighs> I know. It's... Then they're like, there's just. I don't care how many on-flight movies they have. You know, that's just a long flight. Apparently, you can play video games while you're on the plane, and I just that doesn't help. <laughs> it does not make me feel any better. No, even you know, I've only been overseas once, unfortunately, and that was just a uh, over to Europe for my cousin's wedding. Yeah, and I mean. That was an absolute blast, but even flying from New York to Europe, I can't remember, maybe seven. I don't even remember how long it was. It was less than 10, and even that seemed like it took forever. Yeah, 16. I'm hoping that I can like get some really handy medication or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will say this, though. 
um, my wife is originally from Wisconsin. Yeah. And we go out to visit family. And from from our house to her parents' house, it's roughly 16 hours worth of in the car driving. So, yeah, that, but you can't pull over. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to be stuck in a plane for 16 hours. Yeah, that's going to be terrible. Oh Enjoy. My God. No. <laughs> he told me, he was like, all you need to do is take some Advil smash some wine and you'll be fine and i told him that's pretty much what you're not supposed to do <laughs> oh my God. yes alcohol and painkillers perfect yeah basically. how well do you know this guy <laughs> <laughs> well i know him well enough to want to go and that's okay <laughs> All right. but um with the whole cosplay thing yeah yeah i did lord saladin i did rookie i did assassin's creed currently working on witch mercy from overwatch because that's fun. okay and then um, he is currently working on Hanzo because we want to do a costume together. So we'll nice. See. All right. So we're finally going to get into some tech and science news. I got a few articles here. And the first one says this is the first episode of the new year. We're going to start this year off kind of lighthearted. And the first one I have is Riley, the Boston Museum puppy. So we're going to start this year off right with some puppy doggos. Everyone likes puppy doggos. Isn't it Seriously. Year of the Dog, too? It's What's going that? to be, anyway. It's going to be Year of the Dog. Oh, is it? Well, Yeah, it is, perfect. actually. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And we're starting it off with Riley. And I, there was no way I could not include this article in the show because the the picture of this puppy and we are talking legit like one year old or less puppy in the the, the header picture for this and riley is a weimaraner puppy and one of our dogs here uh at the house we do in fact have a weimaraner so Aww. yeah She's of the gray variety as opposed to the brown that's pictured here. So it's pretty much like, well, I have to talk about this. So <laughs> it is in your rights. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So Riley, aside from being cute, actually performs a pretty important function at the museum. And basically, they've been taking on the power of a dog's nose, much like they do with the drug dogs or the bomb sniffing dogs. And they are now training dogs to sniff out, I guess, certain types of bugs and pests that can be a nuisance in museums. Did you get a chance to flip through this article? I did. I did. Yeah. I was, it is amazing what dogs can do, honestly, with their noses and mm -hmm. their senses are just so much better than ours. It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, humans are, if it wasn't for our brains. We're pathetic. <laughs> humans have nothing <laughs> on like true. any other animal. It, like we can't fight. We have no talons. Our jaw strength is pretty pathetic. We really can't run that fast. We can't run that far. We do have endurance, though, which is something that I forget about a lot. Um, yeah, we used we to are... actually, we used to walk our prey to death, apparently, when we were cavemen. Really? Oh, just yeah. keep harassing them until they pass out? Yeah, more or less, because, um, sure, deer can run away, but they have to stop after that mm. whole sprint, and then you can just keep chasing them until they just pass out. <laughs> <laughs> or you get close enough that they give up and they just let you kill them. <laughs> War of attrition. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, outside of that, we really don't have much going on. So this is kind of one of those stories where it's nice and cute and cuddly on the surface. But when you dig a little bit deeper, it's actually really significant. Mm -hmm. Because... Uh, yeah, in the article, there's a, a bunch of other links uh, bringing them to. This is from uh, on the Smithsonian website. And yeah. there are outbreaks and pests of inside of museums all over the place. And, I mean, we used to put, you know, 
ye old mothballs in our <laughs> in our attics to keep the moths well keep the moths away from the clothing so there are insects and pests that you know consume fabrics and well what is canvas you know it's a fabric it is indeed and when you get into a lot of old you know antiquities and old paintings well yeah there's it's going to be some issues and who knows where these things are being stored initially so I mean, it doesn't matter how good they're protected while well, either while they're on display or while they're being transported bugs get into everything you know mm -hmm. they're very hard to keep out and once they're in they're a royal pain to deal with as well like that's why we have the whole fumigation technique for you know insect bombing uh, houses or apartments or and stuff like that so anything that you can do to prevent them in the first place uh, definitely worthwhile yeah, and uh, the fact that these dogs are trained to, like, sit in front of things that they smell the insects in is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, with the whole uh, bomb-sniffing dog, you would think, oh, man, it's a chemical. Of course they can smell it. A lot of people wouldn't really think bugs. They can mm -hmm. smell bugs. <laughs> right. Apparently they can. Like, I've heard them being able to sniff out all sorts of different things. So apparently it's as long as they can, you know, discern that particular scent you just train them to find whatever that particular scent is yeah and they'll search it out i don't know they're pretty smart yeah oh man i'm reading some of these uh little bits in the article as we're talking and a quote from the article weimaraners are a particularly good breed for such tasks since they have stamina and can work for long hours without getting bored weimaraners are energy endless energy bundles uh one of like the main things that weimaraner owners such as ourselves need to get used to is that they have near limitless energy like our weimaraner was like eight years old and she still had the energy of a puppy <laughs> like to the point where our friends would ask like if this is their first time meeting the dog um even when she was like yeah six or seven years old they would ask like oh how old is this puppy and we would say six and i actually had one friend look up at me and ask months <laughs> I'm like, no. six no. years old uh last time i brought uh her name's sophie last time i brought sophie to the vet you know she did a checkup she's in great health and all that but uh the vet mentioned like well you know she's neurotic but that's the way Weimaraners are, so there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> They're just a very high-strung, energetic dog. So to say that they can work long hours without getting bored, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty accurate. So a little something cute to start off the podcast with, a nice, nice Weimaraner puppy. Yeah. Uh, so moving on is microsoft kills off the connect it officially stops manufacturing it so this article is actually a little bit older but it's uh crept back up in the news a few times so rest in peace microsoft connect good. so sad <laughs> <laughs> what was that good i said good <laughs> not a fan i take it i don't know it just seemed kind of useless Sorry. I feel that <laughs> because I was an Xbox gamer for so long and it had so much promise and potential. It did. But it just, that Xbox One launch was so damaging to the front. Yeah. Go ahead. Honestly, no, you're completely right. It was awful. <laughs> it was so damaging. They, I don't know if they really so much as skimped on the power or just underestimated the amount that they would need or something. I don't know if it was a budget issue, but it was underpowered, sadly. And they, I remember one of the main issues was that they were reserving processing power so that the Kinect would be able to constantly either uh, listen for audio commands or watch for visual cues. So while it was running the games in like the first six months to a year or so of the Xbox One's launch, 
parts of its processing was being reserved for the connect yeah which then in turn had decreased performance obviously for the rest of the console and the whole gaming experience oh, so sad for me yeah. anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't know i just um i never had one uh i mm -hmm. feel like if they wanted it to survive that they would have needed to push more on good connect games Good right. ones, not just connect games. Good connect games. Mm -hmm. um, if they had reached in and used their fancy franchise money, like Halo, and done something with Connect, I'm sure that it would have stuck around a little bit longer, and it would have found, I don't know, a proper place. Something. Yeah, yeah. Anything. Honestly, um, done... a lot of the connect games are uh, pointed more towards the family friendly market, and mm -hmm. we does that great. We, you, and Nintendo is great at the whole family-friendly market and kids and, you mm -hmm. know, the, the interactivity. But um, I just feel like they weren't trying to market it well enough to a more diverse crowd, if that makes sense. It's, I don't know. No, it's, that's basically what it was. Like, just so many possibilities, but they weren't able to capitalize on any of them. And it really wasn't performing at the level that they were initially promising. Really, only the the only thing that the Kinect is even used for regularly is people tearing it off from an Xbox and using it for robotics yep. <laughs> for the camera. No, well, basically, um, the when I had Zofiel Ray, another cosplayer, actually on the show a few months back, she actually was able to purchase a used Xbox 360 Kinect, and mm -hmm. she downloaded some software uh, for her computer and use the connect to create a 3d scanner like a diy oh, scanner yeah yeah i know a few people that have done that too so like the technology is there and further down this article this one's from the verge it matches that you know quote it's easy to dismiss the connect as a failed project but the reality is that the research and hardware has helped microsoft progress its products elsewhere so really they were treating it as like interim Okay, you know what? That also, I was going to go with like test market to help like <laughs> refine the technology uh, yes. because it says that it's it's used in the Hololens, which they're still trying to push, and it's using like the same concepts and the technology are used in other products, and I guess it also mentions that Apple has acquired Prime Sense, who are the original makers of the Connect. I see. So the tech is still being used. I guess this was just like its first initial forms, like the infancy of the technology, because it could do I a see. lot of cool stuff. Yeah. Just couldn't cut it in the gaming market, unfortunately. Yeah. And if they were actually planning to use it as a way to get a leg up, that's very smart. But mm -hmm. uh, it seems weird that they would have wasted so much money trying to make it work in the gaming industry. <sighs> Well, again, that just goes with the the botched launch of the yeah. of the console. I mean, just too too many things all at the same time. The community just rebelled in its entirety against the Xbox One. So many people jumped ship to the PlayStation side. I finally yeah. have jumped ship to the PlayStation side. I have both, so I am an infidel or something. Heretic. <laughs> <laughs> Filthy casual. I Welcome know, I'm aboard. sorry. <laughs> uh, so that's official. They killed it. It's done for. But its technology will still be used in other forms. So we'll see how that all pans out. Um, yeah. Not all is lost. It could be. Uh, mm. And the last bit of tech and science news, and I just need to think of some type of term or bit or title for a new section where I just mock idiots who don't know anything <laughs> about, about science. So the this has been making the rounds on the net. It's called raw water. Have you seen this? Yes, I have. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh my god. Why must you be this way? Why 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 do we need to have these conversations? So 
Okay, so apparently we need to we need to tell people the dangers of drinking unfiltered water. Now, <laughs> I there are parts of the country where people are able to access water from different wells. Uh, the water itself gets filtered naturally through different rocks and um, through the earth, and it it, it is spring water is healthy to try or is of a proper cleanliness, I guess we'll say to drink, but it's correct. It, okay, so this is a thing. However, <laughs> <laughs> apparently there's a new Silicon Valley trend going on where you can get quote raw water. And this are, I mean, the more you learn about this, creation and this market it's all marketing like the more hilarious it gets <laughs> isn't that usually the case though <laughs> yeah it really is like d digging deeper into things it just gets more hilarious so again it's a raw water and by raw i mean someone bottled this from some spring and they are now selling it uh as raw water but i'm scanning the article right now so i can get a price tag on it wasn't it like a hundred and something dollars i thought it was like forty dollars for a two gallon jug <laughs> which is just so insane so again uh, it, there are places where you can drink unfiltered you know well water yeah i mean totally. i had one of those uh, when okay. i grew up we had a well okay yeah it's but, not it's not crazy it happens right. <laughs> but, but, but there are also like filters that you can send your water through so that you know yes. you, you get rid of some of the microbes and what's really like the kicking points here is all right so the guy's name is mukande singh who was originally known as christopher sanborn <laughs> is the founder of Live Water. So he changed his name from Christopher Sanborn to Makandi Singh. And he refers to <laughs> tap water as, quote, dead water. And the, the quote from him is, tap water, you're drinking toilet water with birth control drugs in them. Oh Chloramine. <laughs> and on top of that, they're putting in fluoride. Now, call me a conspiracy theorist, but it's a mind control drug that has no benefit to our dental health. You know, if they had birth control water, I would sign up. <laughs> Maybe. Honestly, it's free. You don't have to go to the doctor. It's great. <laughs> um, so he's the founder of Live Water. This other raw water is being marketed from the guy who originally created the Juicero and yeah, so Doug Evans originally brought us the Juicero machine, which is a $400 juicer that used these liquid pouches to, I don't know, it was like a fruit and vegetable concentrate that it created cold-pressed juice, but apparently the $400 juicer just squeezed the bag and people figured out you just squeezed that bag by hand and you didn't need <laughs> A $400 <laughs> juicer to make this work? Oh, my God. And it's just, like, everything in this article is what's wrong with, like, the science-denying community that pushes into, like, the spirituality of everything. Like, you can go yeah. on your spirituality retreats. Whatever helps you find peace of mind in this chaotic world, I am all for it. Because, like... The world is chaotic. I totally get that. However you can find peace and find peace within yourself, do it up. But don't tell me that unfiltered water is going to, like, stabilize your chakras or whatever nonsense. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> I just... I just... At this point, if people want to drink this water... And somebody gets horrendously sick. You know what? Good. It's, it's fine. It's, it's one less stupid person. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, we, we shouldn't have to discuss the the reasons why we have filtered water to begin with. 
Yeah, you filtered know, water. Ju you know, just like like pasteurization. All right, it, pasteurization is not just some random ter term. Is Louis Pasteur? All right, that's where it comes from, because people mm -hmm. were getting sick from drinking unsanitized milk. <sighs> I feel like people forget that we have rules for a reason. Sometimes it really, it really is. I think we've gone so far that we are so safe in our society. We are so incredibly safe that we forget. Yes. We have forgotten the reason why we have all these different regulations and safeguards in place to begin with. Yeah, like um, a good example would be if you ever take a woodshop class, they tell you to wear eyeglasses. And mm -hmm. I knew kids that just wouldn't because they're like, oh, well, you don't really need to. I guess I, I don't have to worry about it because the dust don't, doesn't get in my eyes. And they didn't quite understand the fact that your blade can break and snap off and fly into your eyeball. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, all sorts of horrible things can happen uh, when using just power equipment in general. Yeah, and it's just, it's just, I don't understand how people just don't have the, they don't have the desire to learn why things are the way that they are, mm -hmm. I guess. Because that's what drives me mainly in my life is just, I love learning things. If you mm -hmm. set down a book in front of me, I'm going to freaking read it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Be being a lifelong learner is just great. But I don't know. It's just, there's so many people out there that are so hard-headed in what they believe that they just don't even care anymore. As right. long as they're right. And it's like it's a really little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing, especially when you decide to just close your mind off from any additional new information from getting in. Very much so, yes. So, like, I've seen a few other things where if you take just a little bit of information and you hold on to those concepts, yeah, those concepts can be very dangerous. Like, there's a lot of things regarding the, the whole anti-vax movement where, you know, there are certain potentially dangerous and deadly chemicals that are used in the preparation of the vaccines. However, the forms of these chemicals that are being used and the concentration and why they're being used is what's es escaping a lot of people. Like, yeah, we are using this you know aluminum and stuff and but there's a reason for it and the concentration yes, it's not just is in there to poison you they're right. not just doing it to mess with you because one that would cost too much money <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and two why would you be giving random kids autism there's no i mean what's the point there's no reason it's just oh. <laughs> what's your end game here exactly there is no end game it's because the game doesn't exist <laughs> Oh my god. So, me personally, whenever I hear the whole anti-vaccination thing, I I I know a lot of people with autism. I know I I have a very small um I have Asperger's, so it doesn't affect me as badly. Okay. But people like to think that autism is like the worst thing that can happen to you. Pardon my language. <laughs> it's they think that it's the worst thing that can happen to you, and it really isn't. These women would rather have their kids die of polio than have Asperger's? Really? Is that what yes. you're telling me? All right, so we're going to move into an audible interlude <laughs> right now. <laughs> People so for you, the anything. listeners of the Video Game Cross Like Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. All you have to do is go to audibletrial.com slash VGXTPod and sign up for your free trial and download one of over 180,000 titles, such as Ready Player One by Ernest Klein, narrated by Will Wheaton. And I've already mentioned this book before on here but we're just gonna go ahead and bring it back just because we've gotten some new trailers for this movie and it it really does look absolutely amazing that it's worth bringing up again have you seen these yeah. trailers i have heard of the book i have not seen the trailers you i'm going <laughs> I'm to get, you need to go watch these trailers i will i will um I am actually going to 
look up a trailer right now and send it in our little chat and we're just gonna oh, see you're gonna make me watch <laughs> do you think blizzard paid for that cameo i don't know i don't know i lost track after like 15. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> There are so many pop culture references just in that. And basically, uh, as I've mentioned before, the only reason why someone or something didn't make it into this movie is because they just couldn't afford the uh, the rights for it. Probably. <laughs> so one more time to get your free trial, go to audibletrial.com slash VGXT pod. Start it up. All right. So moving on to some gaming and geekery as I go back to the show notes there I am I All like right, gaming. so first one the cyberpunk 2077 twitter comes alive after three years of silence that is exciting so are you big to the cyberpunk scene at all like as a genre uh a little bit I did um you're, we're gonna talk about it later but I did a little bit of RP when I was younger okay in, like a, in a role play club and we did cyberpunk stuff and nice I I don't know. Um, I don't know very much about it. I will admit. And that's the thing. Like, very few people do. Like, they've been very quiet. What we do know is the same developer as the Witcher series. So that has a lot Witcher of clout. Series, if it's the same developer as the Witcher series, it's going to be great. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's basically how it goes down. So CD Projekt Red the Witcher series, they're going to take on cyberpunk universe. And like, that's all we know. Hmm. I, I, I've, they have been so like shut door on it all, or if that's even a proper term, but so like tight lipped about everything. There's been a few like interviews with some staff here and there, but really not much. And when this tweet came out, like, and all it was, was like asterisk beep, B-E-E-P, asterisk. Like, that's it. All they did was like beep. I'm just saying it's such a good idea to be that subtle. It entices people. Oh, yeah. It's like that's, that's all they needed to do. Mm -hmm. just, and I remember seeing it on my Twitter feed after people like retweeted it and liked it and all that. And I just like, wait a second. What is this? Wait a second. <laughs> and if you go to their Twitter account, it's, it's literally been three years since they've had any activity. And all it was just beep. And I swear they yeah, at least the doubled. Broken. Yeah, it really did. It really did. And like their Twitter following like tripled or something like that within 24 hours. Like they went from like, you know, kind of a cult following type of thing. They had some attention, not really much going on. And then they just like tripled. Just build the hype. Right. And that's, and that's, and that's all they had to do. Honestly, I'm just, really amazed that there's no leaks or anything after all this time. Um, I used to work in a testing industry, so just random, sh random stuff gets pasted on the internet all the time, and I'm I'm really proud of them for not doing that. <laughs> right, like I don't even know how you can keep that tight of a lid on it because you, you don't tell anyone. No one. That's, that's the only way they can do it. Like, do they have just a separate internal network where like they just. Like you, your network computers in the office are on a, like a completely physically different set of wires than what goes out to the rest of the world. Yeah, probably. <laughs> That's like the only yeah, way. Good filtering. Just, I mean, we mentioned Assassin's Creed earlier. Uh, speaking of leaky franchises. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. I almost don't know if they do it on purpose, though, to build like right. hype. So, yeah, sometimes every once in a while, like, oh, this image just so happened to find their way into whatever this, you know, one news outlet's hand just so happened to get leaked at this point. Yeah. Um, some of the timing is a bit suspicious, and there are other times where I'm fairly certain that, like, yeah, that actually was a legitimate leak. 
but yeah this there's been nothing uh when fallout 4 was finally announced there was maybe two or three leaks regarding that game and that was basically just you know some people from bethesda were seen taking pictures around boston or like a single random page of one of the scripts was able to to get out into someone's hands but cyberpunk like there's just been nothing except for this one just hello hey you know we're we're still around so yeah like i said it's uh, the same people as the witcher so expect a very detailed very interactive very just all the great i sadly have not played a full witcher game and i emphasize the sadly part of that statement me either honestly <sighs> i haven't even played any of the witcher series but i know there's fantastic at what they do right like you know and that is testament to them like both of us have not com- completed a full game yet that's how much faith we have in their ability to craft a story <laughs> yeah i mean they haven't they don't have any of that weird controversy that a lot of um developers have mm-hmm where oh man uh the entire player base is upset because they did this one thing they don't have that you know now that you mention and that it that means a lot nowadays <laughs> now that you mention it i really don't hear remember of anything coming out regarding the witcher regarding anything remotely close to that wow that's actually pretty yeah, that's such a big thing <laughs> yeah i mean nowadays especially with all the microtransaction stuff that's going on and oh yeah people are angry about loot boxes it's just to not piss off your player base is a really good step <laughs> <laughs> and that's how low the bar is yeah all right so cyberpunk beeped on twitter <laughs> Good uh, reaction. So, other gaming geekery news. This is the first episode since the holiday season. So, uh, a little movie came out around Christmas called Star Wars The Last Jedi. So, have you seen it? Yes, I have. Excellent. And? I thought it was fantastic. A lot of people will disagree, but I thought it was good. It's really interesting to see the different parts that people react to. I will agree with some people in that some of the certain scenes, a a couple of particular fight scenes did seem a little unrealistic as far as where I would expect each person's weapons ability to be. Yeah. Um, So slight spoilers ahead. (laughs) <laughs> well, just just uh, go for it just a few <laughs> slight spoilers when ray and kylo fend off the entire room of like the royal guard oh yeah the uh pra- praetorians praetorian yes. guard yeah that's because i don't know how much training ray has actually had but for her to be still so new with the force and for her to take on an entire room of the praetorian that it seems a little far. Yeah, I I felt a little weird. I will admit, as somebody that knows about Star Wars and ha- yeah, knows enough about Star Wars, right? Say, it felt it felt a little weird. Yeah, and you don't even need to know like their proper name. You're in this royal throne room. They're all in like full red garb and dress, and they all have their mm-hmm. own specialty weapons. You know, they're badasses. Or we get it. <laughs> Uh, and then, and this has like nothing to do with the combat. It's just that there's another scene where a ship crashes into like the loading bay or the ship bay, and everything's just blown to high hell, and everything's on fire. But Finn and Rose are like, "What just happened?" Like completely <laughs> unsinged. Yeah. It's just. Uh. Uh, just it was a little unrealistic at times yeah, yeah no i understand that yeah. but it would have been great if they had been like thrown against a wall <laughs> something like acknowledge that the the place just exploded like the entire ship bay just exploded just acknowledge that yeah but that's pretty much where my griping ends the rest of the movie i yeah um 
I think the thing that I was most impressed with, I went into that movie hearing a lot of people that were upset and I ended up just going in and not having any expectations. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the best thing I could have done. <laughs> that really is the best thing that like anyone can do because the things that get reported on the internet are the ones that are the most extreme and click worthy, click baby. Yeah. So if someone can have like the strongest, meanest words they can possibly imagine and muster, that's what's going to get printed. That's what's going to get published. Like there's no. I... Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, I was just saying with the whole. The thing that impressed me with that movie is that I actually got caught up in the story of it mm-hmm. towards the end when you had the whole uh, Ray and Kylo trying er, Ray trying to persuade Kylo to join her. Mm-hmm. I was honestly really, really, really hoping that he would. And usually that kind of um, reality break doesn't happen for me in movies. I usually come at it in a very logical way where I'll watch it and I'll predict what's happening as mm-hmm. I'm watching it. With that, I was just so lost in it. I was just really hoping that he would finally be good. <laughs> <laughs> the sense. And Bye. I also really like the way that they dealt with... All right, so I won't do this spoiler, but how they handled Luke Skywalker at the end. Yeah. And treated was... his legacy. And treated like his whole character and what it means to the series and the franchise as a whole. I thought that was. I feel like it. No, go for it. I, I thought it was fitting, and it yeah, was proper. I felt, I felt that it made him very realistic as a character. Mm-hmm. It's like this guy has gone through so much, and he never signed up for any of it. I felt bad. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, yeah, not really. Um, there were some jokes I saw about how, um, you know. Oh, it was a betrayal to Luke Skywalker's character. He would never run away from a problem when he saw that his student got out of hand. And then some other people were uh, noted, well, if you take a look at what Obi-Wan did, went to a desert planet, changed his name when his student got out of control. <laughs> and Master Yoda hid on like a swamp planet when his student got out of control. <laughs> so running away? pretty much what jedi masters do (laughs) so there's a precedence (laughs) that's been set up here good point but um really imaginative locations uh the rest of the world got their first taste of porgs uh as did chewy yeah did you hear about uh the reason why they were put in the movie no i did not um, the location that they filmed at was a animal reserve that for, um, I think it was an animal reserve. Anyway, um, for some reason, puffins, there were puffins all over the island and they couldn't get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, they had, and so they had decided that, um, masking them with, uh, something else because they're so far in the background. You just see these little dots flying around and crap. You can't get rid of them. They, they felt that it was easier to add a, an animal into the ga- into the movie rather than have to like worry about photoshopping them out of all the scenes. That is fantastic. So they just covered them up with space penguins. <laughs> yeah, basically. That is so. And, and right there is your marketing, <laughs> your aftermarket uh, ancillary yeah. incomes, because obviously everyone, every kid is going to want a porg, a space penguin. I was really, I was really nervous going into that movie that they were going to make it really like dumb and stupid, but they put them in there in a good way. Yes. I feel it wasn't like, it wasn't like heavy marketing or anything. That's what I enjoyed. Okay. Right. It wasn't. They felt like they belonged. Yeah. Oh, so the one thing that I did not enjoy about the movie was that forced romance at the end. I hated it. <sighs> it was so forced. It felt forced. I didn't like it at all. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying like those two characters wouldn't be able to have a romance together. I just wish that it was done better. Yeah, because it just kind of came out of nowhere. And yeah, it, I, I just felt it just, that's not how relationships work. No, no, no they really don't. <laughs> and if and if that is how you're trying to start the relationship, uh, uh, that, that's it's a little like, much. Oh man, I'm, I'm dying. Love me. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> One of those things. 
Um, I felt like if it had been portrayed in a way that they maybe both were going to die suddenly, mm -hmm. then it would have been okay. Because it's like one of those things where it's like last minute, you just gotta tell them mm -hmm. kind of thing. But 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 leaving somebody with that information, it's a little weird. Yeah, but even, and even <laughs> then, like there's to get to that deep level of devotion and emotional attachment, you gotta have more than just half of one movie. Yeah, they, she didn't even really like have a good conversation with him or anything. Yeah, so yeah, that that was forced. <laughs> you know, not every <laughs> movie or franchise has to have a love tension in it. Um, That's honestly, and, why I hate movies mostly. <laughs> I mean, I again, I'm been referencing the previous episode quite a bit in this episode but going back to my last episode with jess i mentioned how i enjoyed the thor ragnarok because they didn't have a love story in it or they didn't try to yeah. force something with uh natalie portman's character yes thank you oh my god <laughs> it was just so unnatural and forced and it didn't fit and they were able to have a legitimate story without you know, romance. It's okay to not have romance. It's okay. But it um, is okay. But overall, it's okay not to have heterosexual romance. Yeah, totally fine. <laughs> uh, so anyway, again, we gripe a little bit, but you and I were pretty much in agreement. If you get the opportunity to go yeah, see Last it's Jedi it's and you're a sci-fi nerd, absolutely go movie. see it. Don't worry about like some of the, was... the minor stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, just for my own reassurance, what was your favorite scene? Ah, uh, the final standoff. Really? Actually, yeah. Because there was so much yeah. that happened. Like, that's where their personalities and their their approach to problems really came through. So, yeah. slight spoiler, sl slight with Kylo, it's just destroy everything. If something is in your way, you destroy it absolutely. And with his opponent, <laughs> try not to give too many spoilers here, it's more forethought it's more extracting the information that you, it's it's more planned it's more controlled yes it's very well thought out yeah it, and it definitely sh allows their personalities to shine forth in a way that you know is true to their character and their nuances and their approach to problems in general so that's um and yours obviously uh Oh, um, my my favorite scene was um, the silent scene that happened where uh, they destroyed one of those larger ships. Oh, and the the sound, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the black and the, the white absolute silence. Oh for a my few god, seconds. I I was so happy that they had complete silence with that. I was I was praying honestly when I saw that she was gonna uh, use the ship to crash into the other one. Mm -hmm. um, because when it comes to those kinds of intense moments silence is like the best thing that you can do audio wise right and i just felt it fit so perfectly and i really wish that more films would do it but that's one of those but, um, things where one thing okay no, so that's one ahead. of those <laughs> so that's one of those things where like i agree that more films should do it however you need to use such extreme caution with something that potentially dramatic that if it doesn't really fit then it's gonna oh, seem yes, a little like a little too try hard if you will mm -hmm. you have to build up to it for sure the amount of stress that was literally the whole movie was about building up the stress for that one scene mm -hmm. okay with, roughly i mean over half of the movie at least right which i felt it fit perfectly i don't know yes the way that it was done in here beautiful that's that's the way okay. to do it. That's how you do it. That's how you make a good movie. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, <laughs> definitely excited to see uh, the resolution of this new trilogy. Really want to see where oh, they yes. go with this. Because honestly, I'm 
not entirely sure. I'm just going to assume the good guys win because the whole Star Wars story is a, a story of the good guys winning. <laughs> but um, I don't know where it's going to go. I mean, the bad guys could win because they're going to make a new trilogy. Are there plans for something there after this that I haven't heard? Yes. Yes. Oh. I, I mean, I, I don't, it's one of those things where I read it on the internet and I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I am pretty, sh I'm like 90% sure that they have already talked about building a new trilogy after this. I'm jotting down notes. That's 90%. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so there's been talk, the potential. I'll uh, I'll see what yes. I can find, and I'll drop them to the show notes I mean, as well. Disney just bought Star Wars, that so is true. I doubt they would give up that easily. And then the new Harrison, or not Harrison Ford? <laughs> no, not Harrison Ford. <laughs> actually, <laughs> Han Solo movie. Yeah. What is his name? Uh, Thank you, Han Solo. <laughs> So there's the new Holland Solo movie and then the new um, Obi-Wan Kenobi movie that's going to come out mm. after this. So. so they might take a break. We'll see. All right. So last bit of news for this show. Um, and this actually relates to how you and I actually uh, got connected. We're both actually part of the same Destiny group on Facebook called Destiny The Complete Picture. And I got to give a quick shout out to the people who run these different communities because there are several of the complete picture Facebook groups and they're all, they're moderated pretty damn well. Uh, they really do like yeah. <laughs> the mods, they do a pretty good job as far as like how chaotic any online form can get. They do a pretty good job of like, reducing the amount of salt and whining and complaining it is so true though it really is <laughs> the uh, destiny specifically needs mods there's there's they just need them mods have to happen otherwise the community just falls apart it's, yeah it'll implode in on itself and too much salt well it, it's not so much just too much salt it's that there's no constructive feedback or criticism involved it's just complaining yeah. it's just whoever can fit the most profanity into a single post and be as mean as possible to get as much attention as they can but there's no resolution there's mm -hmm. no there's nothing building up on it which just makes me roll my eyes and keep scrolling past but you know that's just me um so yeah we're both actually part of the destiny the complete picture group on facebook and destiny uh, they've been having some issues with their with their <laughs> player base. They've been having some issues. You know, that's, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, they've been having some issues. Uh, they're working through it as much as they can. Uh, uh, is, it, is it marital issues? <laughs> uh, they, we, we could probably make an analogy or a, a metaphor in there somehow. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the parents and the kids are not on speaking terms right now. <laughs> There's some infighting. But... Yeah. Stepdad. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but they're making progress. Recently, there was a new uh, dev update that was released, and it's a whole, whole lot of information. And a lot of this is really stemming from, and I have a few blog posts about this, but the super bare bones approach that they've had in developing this game. And as much as I've been patient, and I even have a blog post up that says, you know, in defense of Bungie's bare bones approach, they, they got to move something along. As much as I like the yeah. idea that they start bare bones, listen to the community, and then add things slowly when they are sure that they'll work properly, it's mm, just, you got to loosen up the purse strings a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if it just I don't know if it works because I love Destiny. I've loved Destiny all my life. I mean, Destiny's life, not mm -hmm. mine. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, you're, but, um, what, you're what, four years old? I mean, <laughs> yeah, about. 
No, um, I have loved Destiny all throughout its entire development, mm. and even through the really rough stuff like House of Wolves and all that. Mm. Um, but I really just want to buy a complete game. I'm really tired of just waiting and waiting and waiting for more updates, yeah. and it's really frustrating. <laughs> and you know, normally, I'm the person who like just doesn't care about Eververse like in the least. Because I, and this time around, I have actually spent a little bit of money in Eververse, but I mean, I've like enough to purchase like a, a, less than 10 engrams have been purchased, guaranteed. Yes. Um, because I do want to get some of the the exotics or the some, some of the cooler ships or whatever. But even those few that I have purchased, I, like in hopes of getting something worthwhile from those additional engrams that I've, you know, paid for, I ended up just getting the same crap all over again. Like I'm not yeah. going to pay additional five, ten, fifteen, twenty dollars just for some more ghost shells that I'm going to dismantle immediately because they have no perks that are worthwhile, and you know, even legendary shaders I'm not paying additional money for. Yeah, honestly, as a person that has, since, as a person who has been around since when Eververse was first introduced, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like there's multiple problems going on here that they need to fix, which is one, uh, they are no longer, it's all random now, they're no longer able to purchase direct items with money. Mm -hmm. You can buy direct items with Bright Dust, but you can't, that's not money, that's chance money if that makes sense yeah it's a little little twisted but yeah i got gotcha. you yeah so you can't get bright dust unless you pay for silver and the amount of bright dust that you get is entirely random as well which is just messed up so okay, so you will also get bright be... dust if you dismantle anything that you get from yes. eververse so you do get <laughs> some but it, it trickles in yeah, the thing with that, though, is um, you can pay for 10 engrams and then get the absolute minimum amount of bright dust, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Because each item gives only a certain amount. Right. So, like, if you have a ghost shell, I think it gives, like, 25 or something. So, if you got only shaders, you would have far less bright dust that oh, is possible unless you got only emotes mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah emotes and some so of the sparrows and ships <laughs> give you a lot of bright dust also but again it's it's just random it's entirely rng yeah. and i feel like that is a that me personally that is the the main point that i struggle with because like when destiny first came out the only reason that we had a reverse was to buy very specific emotes that you wanted and i was totally down for that mm -hmm. i paid ten dollars for the srl race book because i was like you know what it's ten bucks i'm a completionist done i didn't have to wait mm -hmm. loot box wise to get it um and it's just really really frustrating to the community i think with the whole the fact that there's so much locked behind the paywall and, that you can't even get in the game right and that's where that's where the issue is like they've swung too far in that direction and in this dev like, update they have acknowledged it and they are going to be shifting it back and again some other like really good points is the exotic ghost shells and the exotic ships you know in destiny one something of that level would be obtainable not through rng but through completing a specific quest line or series of quests or other just milestones put it in the game just put it in the game. Right. Like, for instance, <laughs> I think... Put it behind something really, really hard to do, right. but put it in the game. Like, I think... Well, I don't think that we had exotic ghost shells or ships in Destiny we did 1. Not. But, like, no. certain specific items, for instance, um, <laughs> for rare or legendary ships, I had the Vienna Singer in D1, mm -hmm. which I got from completing the... Not Icebreaker the uh black needle yeah black hammer black hammer yes the black hammer quest line or strike mission mission whatever <laughs> anyway uh we had to go through um that one heroic story mission and like swing to the side and then blast through all the taken in under 10 minutes which was oh god oh yeah to get the black spindle stuff yes black spindle Wow, yeah, I got there eventually. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I got the sniper and I was able to get the, that ship, you know, and same thing for a lot of other like specialty items. You had to go through a specific mission or a certain set of milestones and you were able to get whatever that, you know, end piece was. Mm -hmm. So, like, for instance, right, I don't know if it's this weekend or last week, but Ikora Ray's exotic ship is available. Well, no, make that the end goal for doing, I don't know, 200 meditations or something like that. Yeah. You know, ma make it something ridiculous. Fine. 200, 300 meditations um, throughout the span of, you know, Destiny 2 make it like that but if you see someone flying that ship that is a statement to other people who see it like yeah i do a lot of these meditations and the no, same thing for like angry. other sparrows or ghost shells or ships it's like if you're able to see that in a loading screen like <laughs> a joke that me and my brother had when we were playing on uh the xbox our uh, a friend of ours had the crota's end ship and we had like yeah. the, old, the old standards that we got from other, you know, engrams or rewards or whatever. And, you know, suddenly this like bone dragon flew into the loading screen and we're all like, oh, we all know whose uh, ship that is. Type of joke. <laughs> yeah. And it really should be placed into the, or at least obtainable in the game. Uh, I don't know. It's but but to be fair to be fair they are addressing it so in the i'm on the paragraph right now actually in the dev notes eververse we recognize that the scales are tipped too far towards tests at the moment and eververse was never intended to be a substitute for end game content and rewards good so we'll be making three changes and they list the changes about how uh things will be handled differently yeah. so they're taking the steps but i'm happy that they are acknowledging it i just don't know if they are going to necessarily produce something that the player base is going to want mm. because i don't know it's just weird that they have locked content behind a paywall that you can't get anywhere else in the game that's just bizarre to me uh it's yeah. Blizzard does really good with it in terms of like playing Overwatch. You have like a tiny, teeny, tiny chance to get something that you actually want. However, you can still pay for it. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. But I guess you haven't played Blizzard or you haven't played Overwatch, so never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm so lame. I'm sorry. But um, no, it's okay. So there's a lot of things going on in this update, and as you scroll down, there. They're, they give you a future roadmap of where they're going, and there's a lot in here. And mm -hmm. aside from things that I kind of think should have been in there to begin with, um, there are some interesting additions that they're making, like uh, Crucible. We're going to be having Valor and Glory uh, added to your ranking system. Yeah, was... I noticed that. Um, I'm not quite sure how to feel about it, though. Yeah, I don't know really what that i don't know what it means actually but awesome if you're big into pvp so that'll be interesting to see how that works out and, but some other things uh, that i think really should have just been in there from the beginning and this i'm really going to complain about this there's one of the few things that i have like an actual very strong opinion about and that is the raid gear so i yes. wasn't a huge raider uh, back in Destiny 1, again, because I just, I'm more of like a solo player by nature, but uh, Destiny has mm -hmm. opened me up to a little bit more of the co-op and PvP and multiplayer type things, but I'm still very much a solo player when I game. That said, I absolutely loved the King's Fall raid set for my Warlock. Yeah. And the fact that the current raid gear doesn't have activity specific perks just blew my mind <laughs> yeah i noticed it was just blew my mind even prison of elders armor sets had specific perks attached to them why 
dear God, why would you not have raid perks in the raid set? I mean, I think maybe that they wanted it to not necessarily mean that because you are wearing raid armor, you have to be raiding and that it's still useful in other instances. Yeah, but like, the, ah! <laughs> like I just walked around basically in my raid gear all the time until I got like another armor set I could replace it with in D1. Mm -hmm. But the perks that you got were basically just there were additional perks on top of the established armor perks, but they oh, only activated during specific raid activities, like increased agility when you were torn between dimensions. Like outside yes. of the raid, that perk means absolutely nothing. So why don't just like tag on at the end of the perk list, say increased reload speed when you're in the shadow realm? when fighting callus or something yeah, to that effect know. or increased agility when, or speed or movement speed when you're holding one of the sparks in the in the gauntlet you know something yeah something, something minor it's not really game breaking but it gives you an additional advantage just when you're in the raid like it just it just made no sense to me that they they just left that out because what ends up what ended up happening was the raid set was just another fashion show rather than something utilitarian or useful. Yeah, I <sighs> um I think a big reason why raids kind of failed too was because uh, the token system. You're not actually receiving any armor by playing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like that is another reason why the uh, nobody raids anymore. Nobody really does in my clan even. Um, we were because we wanted to get the armor, and as soon as we got the armor, we realized, well, this is kind of useless. <laughs> we don't need it. Never mind. We're yeah. not going to spend six hours in this event that we're only going to get maybe one item. No. Right. But um, so they are saying in the raid rework section of the dev update, we are updating the raid rewards to make them more unique and interesting. They will now feature mods with raid specific perks, and we are adjusting the rewards to ensure raid item drops from each major encounter. So they're adjusting and they're addressing Which all of those good. issues. I really but, appreciate that. <laughs> but, as do I, but for the love of God, why was it in there to begin with? Like this is too is like the biggest dropped ball. <laughs> like, and I still love the game, and I will be coming back to it. But some that I've mentioned on other forums and to other you know people who play the game, you know what? Take a break. That's yeah. what I'm doing right now. Um, Same. There are so many games out there. As I said, I'm playing uh, Assassin's Creed Origins right now. Absolutely loving it. I, it it actually did take a conscious effort for me to stop playing Destiny for a bit. Yeah. Just because it's just habit and so much fun. But it's pretty addictive. Yeah. But really, take a break. You know, I gave up on Destiny One. I did not play a I did not play the game at all between initial or um during the dark below. Oh, how dare you? I know. So between you Dark Below, your baby? <laughs> so between Dark Below and House of Wolves, I just like ah, eh, this game isn't for me. But then I saw my brother, who finally got himself an Xbox One. And again, this is going back three, four years. He finally got involved. It's like oh, so I finally have people to play with now, type of thing. So I you know, yeah. you know warm the game back up again, and it was the game is so much more fun to begin with to play when you have a whole crew to play with and it took until the second dlc for it to feel like a remotely complete game so you know we'll see how destiny 2 progresses but uh any other comments regarding the dev update there's a lot of information in this thing there's a lot of information um Maybe not, but one thing that I wanted to bring up with Destiny was uh, Destiny 1, I played it religiously, and that was only because I was so interested in the universe, and I don't know what it was specifically that enamored me in such a way, but um, 
I think it was finally that I found a sci-fi that I could like hook into and enjoy. Okay. As um, it's really hard to explain almost. Um. Well, the world Dark is Below... very deep. The lore is very, very deep yes. in this game. Yes, yes. Um, I never even started looking into the lore until maybe about Taken King's time. Okay. But just being in the game alone, but surrounded by other people out in the Cosmodrome and just running around doing bounties was the most interesting thing to me. <laughs> and um, I feel almost like Destiny 2 lost whatever it had. It's not as interesting as it used to be, and I don't think it's just because I'm worn out on it or anything. Because I still love Destiny One. I've actually gone back to playing that. Oh, have you? But yeah, uh, I have a few friends that I uh, we just do raids now. It's just really fun. Okay. But um, it just has so much more content than Destiny Two, and it's really depressing because <laughs> <laughs> everyone was going into Destiny Two hoping for a good game, and then we ended up with another Destiny One vanilla. <laughs> And it just felt really disappointing, more than anything. I love Destiny, I love Bungie, and I really put my faith in them every time that I hope that they're going to fix it, but it's getting really tiresome. Yeah, so, you know, just... I'll see what happens when the next DLC drops, because the the next event is Crimson... What is Crimson Days. Crimson Days, right. Yes, I don't care I about PvP, that. so I'm going to be skipping that in its entirety. I have no Planes, desire I'm to. So... Oh, it's so much fun though. Or at least it wasn't hey. Destiny One. <laughs> well, then you enjoy yourself, and I will catch you the next time, uh, whatever the next DLC is, which uh, and... should be in spring. I... God's right. of Mars. Yes, which I have slight prediction here from all the other like lore master videos that i've been watching and some of the things i've been reading in regards to the lore and what's going on which uh two videos from my name is bife that i highly recommend watching in preparation for this dlc and that is the arecibo adventure where you uh go find all the other little music boxes over on io yes and there is another one where he does like a quick everything we know type thing uh, about this subject. The and I have a adventure was absolutely fantastically made. Oh yeah, yeah. just the I think it might have been just the music aspect and bringing it into the game uh, very uh, mysterious. I guess mm -hmm. that was the kind of sci-fi adventure that I missed. Right, uh, it's just so like how deep they actually went into what these uh, these passages are actually from and where the music is actually originated from. There's so many layers to the lore in this case. It's just amazing. But between those two videos, there's a few mentions of uh, the Bray family and Clovis Bray. And I wonder if the gods of Mars that we're discussing isn't necessarily either Rasputin or the Warmines, I'm wondering if the, quote, gods, end quote, of Mars is actually the Bray family, and we have Ooh. to, yeah, clean up one of their messes or something to that effect. Or that they're, like, heavily involved. Um, I want to say that compared to Curse of Osiris, uh, I'm going to say that we probably won't have any, very much interaction with another NPC, I want to say. Mm -hmm. I would be very, very surprised if Anna Bray actually shows up, unless we just talk to her. Right. Or have it's a either going to be Anna Bray, or I'm thinking, like, I think her name was Elsie Bray, is also somewhere in the lore. Yes, I think she might be dead. In the official canon of the lore, right now, as the game sits, Anna Bray is supposed to be dead, but... I thought Elsie was dead, and Anna just disappeared. I think he got it flipped. Although I could be entirely okay. wrong. So <laughs> one of the sisters is around. One of the sisters disappeared. And one of the sister allegedly has been killed off. But um, who knows? I just realized that Elsie and Anna sounds like Elsa and Anna from Frozen. And it's from the what? Frozen Wasteland. It's just, and now oh, we're going to the Frozen like Tundra. No. Oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't ask for this. <laughs> Oh man! Please, at some point, at least give us an adventure that that says "Let It Go." 
I would just laugh my oh my god I'd laugh really hard if they got Nolan to just say let it go just let it go Anna let it go <laughs> oh goodness gracious oh boy all I right. Know. I really hope they talk about Charlemagne at least because I have been waiting for that since Destiny One. There, there are so many loose ends in the Destiny lore that just aren't being discussed, oh, and it's like, awful. I'm, I'm getting worried <laughs> that they're going to fly off on too many different lore tangents and not come around to completing any of them because that's like. A real pet peeve of mine with American oh, television yeah. shows in that they just kind of keep crunching out the the seasons until no one cares about the series anymore and then they just like wrap it up in this hastily written yeah. like final season you know I know wrap things up appropriately and like it's we've so we haven't heard anything about Savathun since vanilla like there's no reference in I feel like that's too Curse soon, though. I agree, but it's just the fact that we now have Savathun is going to be entering the fray. Curia, um, there are references to Curia, which if you're unfamiliar with these two terms, there are references to both Curia, uh, Blade Transform, a Vex Mind, actually, and Savathun, who is the sister of the now-dead Oryx. Uh, both of those people are very integral to the Books of Sorrow yes. uh, from Destiny 1 and the, the Taken King. So those two characters, super important in the development of the Taken, and we really haven't discussed them. And then I also have the uh, Nezarek Sin Warlock Helmet, and that's another seemingly super powerful being from beyond the void which hasn't been discussed and there i guess there was another mention somewhere to nacris also which is potentially like crota's brother i thought it was oryx's dad oh, yeah exactly <laughs> so we don't Sometimes. know <laughs> <laughs> so there's still so many unknowns and i just i hope they don't fly off on too many tangents and create too many characters and not bring proper yeah. resolve down because we're still waiting for stuff from destiny one that we haven't even heard of like yeah, like we... charlemagne for example that's one of them <laughs> right and we don't know where eris morn has disappeared to uh we don't know but we know that she ran off after talking to asher right you know about that right all right yes yep yep absolutely yeah but, so um, yeah, yeah they had their little heart to heart and uh, asher was still recovering from falling into the the radialoria in the primidian yeah wow Good i'm job, getting asher. really lore nerdy right now <laughs> <laughs> um we haven't heard anything about the queen we haven't heard anything about the exo stranger nor will we probably ever again <laughs> oh and <laughs> Speaking about the Queen, Prince Aldrin, and how he's supposedly the King of the Fallen at this point. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. <sighs> um, Charlemagne, we haven't heard anything about the SIVA ship that went off into the middle of nowhere. We haven't heard anything about Clovis Bray or Europa. We haven't heard anything about... <sighs> what else haven't we heard about? There's a lot. There's, There's a, lot a lot still going there's too much there's too much right. that we don't know about and it's not cool <laughs> <laughs> give us some answers <laughs>so we're going to move into the final section of this podcast and we do have a listener question and this actually came from destiny the complete picture so spencer cr wants to know what is our favorite raid in either destiny and why so ellie what's your favorite I, raid i'm gonna go with the vault of glass because that's a popular it was, one it is popular um it, it's hard to choose because king's fall is my favorite one to do mechanically mm -hmm. um but vault of glass is my favorite one to do lore wise because i uh I fell in love with the whole Kabir and uh, Paradox mission and what is his name? 
it is leaving me right now, and he's my favorite character, and it's really hard to not remember his name. Peru- <laughs> it's not Perun. Perun is it Panis? Pratith. Pratith. Thank you. There it yes, is. Yes, I love Pratith's story. I was I felt I actually cried, and that was my favorite part. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, learning about the the people that went down into the Vault of Glass originally, and how the map is built really just I don't know it connects with me in a way I love vertical maps when they brought in some verticality to Rise of Iron when they had um, the Cosmodrome covered in snow and there are some areas that you have to actually go up to get into I found Mm -hmm. that kind of expanded the area even though that didn't technically do expand the area it just made it feel bigger I guess I Um, gotcha the Vault of Glass Another reason why it is very important to me is, besides the lore, is the music. Um, when the music Marty wrote originally, um, which actually leaked online a few months back. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, super awesome. It was beautiful. <laughs> but um, <laughs> he made the Destiny 1 notes fill, or fit into his soundtrack and also into the raid so that you would know how to deal with the uh, oracles. Hmm. It's basically like a code hidden inside the music, and I thought that was absolutely perfect. Wow. That is, yeah, yeah I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, there's so much, so many layers to this game. I, I love layers, and then Destiny 2 doesn't have layers, and it makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, yet. Like I said, well, yet. Uh, soon. Yeah, soon. Definitely, it'll come back, but just, I'm, I gotta take a break from it. I'll come back after gods of mars drops but uh for me now i've only been through the callous raid once um i've been through king's fall several times that was my yeah. my most popular raid so i'm kind of actually torn between those two because of the potential that callous raid has like the fact that it ends with a series of just like a stock room of mechanical calluses Uh like he's testing us for sport it is literally like the callus raid is literally his own game show (laughs) for the purpose (laughs) of it it really is it it absolutely is his own personal game show to see who is the most fit like who is the best that can make through his contraptions and his his legions of whatever. His murderous and, game show. Yeah, his yeah super murder murder games, and the potential that they can go through, and the story that's actually written with the lore tabs of the raid gear. <clears throat> that is something that the raid gear does have. Is like an amazing story of his betrayal and how he gets back at those who betrayed him. Um really interesting story there but like the whole like where are we gonna go with this uh is really interesting to me but again as far as like my favorite raid so far it's gonna be even with all that it's still gonna fall back to king's fall because of the balance between the combat heaviness and the mechanic heaviness the balance between those two aspects i really enjoy in king's fall where <clears throat> It is still fairly mechanics heavy, but in a pinch, <laughs> you do have the option to brute force it. Yes, definitely. Um, in like an absolute, there were a few times where, particularly in the, um, I can't remember what the totems where you got to play the game of three way hot potato. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, uh, there was one time in particular where we actually made it through where I was the last surviving guardian oh, <laughs> but but we were able to to work it out where um if i if i wasn't the last surviving there's like maybe two other guys in the middle that were just like shooting anything that moved but i had to run all the way from one side of the hall from the totem through the center and back to the other side to like swap it out and we were able to complete that encounter like oh, the geez. last second yeah but, i had a like that too (laughs) 
but yeah it's just the whole balance between mechanics and the potential for brute forcing your way through um was really enjoyable for me so so that's my vote that king's fall so far has been my favorite raid yeah definitely um one thing i did want to bring up even though it's not my favorite raid uh the binary code that was inside uh wrath of the machine mm -hmm. and how they put actual cutscenes in was actually really interesting oh, yeah. i just thought it, i really miss raids with secrets i guess okay all right, so we're going to move into the final section of this podcast. It is the final five. I yeah. ask every guest five questions at the end of the show to wrap things up. The first two are always the same. The last three have a theme. So here we go. Question one, coffee or tea? Can I say both? Absolutely. I like both. I really like <laughs> the taste of coffee, but... I really like tea too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a uh, time of day thing? Uh, I think, yeah, in a way. Uh, I drink decaf in the morning just because if I drink caffeine, then I'll have a crash afterward. And oh, then okay. for dinner, I drink, um, I drink a Japanese tea that uh, I live in Portland and there's like Portland Japanese gardens here okay. and they have a cafe and they sell their tea there too. And I can't remember what it's called. It's like, I think it's gen matcha and it's literally like drinking this tea is like having dinner. <laughs> oh really? It's so that savory. Sounds wonderful. It's delicious. Okay. All right. So question two, we know you're a video gamer. Do you play any tabletop games? I have not, but I intend to. Okay. I really I really want to play uh I really want to play D and D. I haven't with the RP club that we had, we never actually did any tabletop stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, other than, I guess, just rolling dice. I don't know if that counts. <laughs> <laughs> but um, doing an actual tabletop RP would be very fun. I just don't have a group. Okay. Well, I'm sure there's ways you can <laughs> rectify that. Yeah. Uh, one of my blog posts I do have up there... Um, if you're looking to get into some of the modern tabletop games, you know, beyond Pathfinder, Dungeons and Dragons, and all that other stuff, uh, I do have a list of five games that will kind of like get you going into the modern tabletop world. So okay. I'll shoot you a link for that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And last three, as I mentioned before, um, we actually know each other through this Destiny group. So we're going to have some uh, Destiny questions here. Yay. Yay. So. Question three, and these are also going to tie into cosplaying. Uh, who would you rather have as a business partner? Uh, Tess Eververse or Ava Levante? Oh, okay. That, that depends on what you mean as a business. <laughs> <laughs> it, business in, uh, in the cosplay world. In the cosplay world, I would rather have Ava Levante because she is a nice old lady and she has she's done nothing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Tess just wants to make money, and I can make money if I want to, but I really don't want to. <laughs> you, know, you know, Eva absolutely has the uh, the sourcing for material down. She'll be able yes, to get you whatever. Does. If she can she... dye my fabric for me, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Perfect. I need actual shaders. Okay. <laughs> All right. Question four. Uh, in Curse of Osiris, are you disappointed by the severe lack of cats to be found? Oh, man. I'm I'm more disappointed in the lack of birds, to be honest. Okay. When I saw Osiris, <laughs> for some reason, I don't know why I thought this, but when I saw Osiris in his outfit, I thought for sure he would be flying a giant eagle. <laughs> I don't he know does why. Have a lot of feathers. I know, and it's gorgeous. And I'm I'm working on a costume for that too, and I totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> my friend's 3D modeling his helmet right now, and it's been like three months, and I totally put it in the uh, back of my mind. <laughs> I don't know. I personally can't stand the feathers in some of the armor sets it. right now. Well, you oh. rock on with your bad self. <laughs> <laughs> I can't they look stand like fur, though. But, but yeah, I mean, the whole Egyptian references and everything. I'm like, no cats? Nothing? I would have appreciated cats. I'm having like, issues in Assassin's Creed Origins because I can't pet the cats, and I don't know why. What? I thought that was, like, actually one of its selling points. 
I know, and I don't know why, but Bayek just won't pet the freaking cats, and I want him to. <laughs> we can pet the dogs and all the other ones. <laughs> Come on, let pet the cats. Connor can weigh, and petting dogs is, that's just what he does. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Final question. Um, if you could choose, who would be your cosplay alter ego? Elaborate, please. As in any of the costumes that you've done, would you consider any of those costumes or characters as, or would you consider them as an alter ego for yourself? Hmm. I, I would appreciate having an alter ego of 2B from Nier Automata. I did a costume of her. It was not very good. But the All way right. that she acts... I wish I, I could act. I wish that it could be less flamboyant. <laughs> really? I have not played that, but it's like been on my list of things oh to go goodness. check out. People look at it and they think, oh, this is this is just for fan service, right? No. Oh my god, that game is deeper than anything that you've ever played before. Okay, I promise. Okay, so I don't know much about the game. I would be happy to tell you if you want. <laughs> let's let's get like quick synopsis because uh, we're running pretty long in this episode. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> um... So, uh, Nier uh, is a series by Yoko Taro, who... Uh, I'd never played his original game, so I don't know very much about it, but it's basically a dystopian human world. Nier Automata takes place many, many, many years in the future from his original game, so, like, everyone's dead. <laughs> okay. All of humanity has died out. You are on, a, uh, you are on Earth, um, basically in this wasteland, all alone. Um, androids were made by humans to eradicate aliens from earth aliens on earth made robots to eradicate the humans so you go down there as an android to kill as many robots as you possibly can to you know defend the human race and all that great stuff and it just turns into this mind melting just ball of loose ends and then as everything starts coming back together it is just an amazing masterpiece. I don't know God, how to explain beautiful. it other than that. Okay. It's, you, the, there's multiple endings to the game too. There oh, are God, five, of those games. Yeah, and I say that five, in, in the most loving way possible. There are five main endings that have cinematics. Um, ending one is like, when you finish ending one, you think that the game is over. And then you remember, oh wait, there's more endings. And then you play it again and you're like, this game is so much bigger than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you get five cinematic endings. There are 26 endings total. Um, those are like joke endings where you can die somewhere randomly and text appears and it just makes you feel like a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's pretty good. Cool. Uh, it's a must play for anybody with a PlayStation, honestly. All right. So I'll throw that one on the list as well. <laughs> And that is all the time we have for this episode. Time for end of show plugs. You can follow me, Anthony Rossi, on Twitter, Instagram, PS4, uh, at HyperSyntax, that's H-Y-P-3-R-S-I-N-T-4-X, or you can follow the podcast directly either on Twitter at VGXDPod or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash VideoGameCrosstalk. This podcast is hosted directly on Podbean and can be found at VideoGameCrosstalk.podbean.com. And as for my guest, Ellie, where can our beautiful listeners follow you around? Um, I am on Instagram mainly. Uh, my tag is novice robes, N-O-V-I-C-E-R-O-B-E-S. You can also find me on Twitter that way. Um, for Facebook, it is Silver Falcon Studios, as well as for Etsy. All right. And finally, if you are a gamer or know a gamer that also talks some tech and science news, let me know. Do you know some tech news you'd like to hear discussed? Do you have any other general questions you'd like to hear answered on the show? Send an email to videogamecrosstalk at gmail.com and give me the deets on what's going down. Please don't forget to like, review, subscribe, and share this podcast all over your social media accounts. And it can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and most other podcast services. Thank you one last time for hanging out with us. And Ellie, thank you one last time for joining me. Thank you very much. All right. And in the words of Lyndon B. Johnson, yesterday is not ours to recover, but tomorrow is ours to win or lose.
Um, so... I... I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> oh, no worries. This is what editing is for. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, um, and so you use these files and models, I guess, as the basis for or to create the foam out or let's try this again so <laughs> no, that's not a proper intro wow i am doing terrible this no, episode it's fine i love terrible <laughs> well you're gonna be in your glory apparently <laughs> <laughs> um 